Hello everyone, welcome to episode 2 of my vodcast. In this episode, I'm sitting down with Emmanuel, the director of ProtoSante, which is a global medical recruitment company. Together, we'll be talking about different topics like the challenges of recruiting healthcare professionals, uh, the role of ethics in healthcare, the trends, changes, emerging demands in healthcare, and how ProtoSante supports uh, hospitals and medical teams across the world. Okay, I hope you enjoy this episode. Let's jump right in. Hello, Emmanuel. Welcome to my podcast. Hi, Danielle. Thank you for having me. Thank you for accepting my invitation. Could you tell us a bit about yourself? Uh, so, my name is Emmanuel. Uh, I'm the director of uh, ProdeSante International. Uh, we are a physician recruitment company, an ethical physician recruitment company. So, I come from a, a teaching background. I was a teacher for 10 years. And during my teaching experience, I traveled a lot because I was a teacher in different countries. Uh, France, of course, because I'm originally from France, and also Vietnam and India. And I joined Prodia Santé International, uh, I joined Prodia Santé Group uh, a bit more than 10 years ago. What is Prodia Santé? What do they do? Uh, at Prodia Santé, we specialize in uh, physician recruitment worldwide. So we have offices here in Canada, Montreal, we have offices in Europe, in uh, um, in uh, the UAE, uh, the United Arab Emirates and in Singapore and our core expertise is to recruit doctors for hospitals and clinics in need of uh, um, new talents to add to their teams. Mm -hmm. um, we recruit also for governments uh, during major crises like the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we also recruit doctors for organizations, for um, NGOs and we have our own philanthropy uh, program. Uh, why did you choose medical recruitment? So you, apparently you're everywhere, right? Uh, yeah, we are everywhere. Um, so I, 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 I've been knowing the company uh, from the very beginning of the, for, from the creation of the company 25 years ago. So I was working for them on and off mm -hmm. uh, between my teaching experience. Um, and one day I decided... So you were uh, like a recruiter simultaneously as, and as a teacher? Not sim you simultaneously, a teacher. but because you know when you apply for a position uh, abroad, when you are a teacher from the French national education, mm -hmm. you have to wait until you have uh, uh, the right position, mm -hmm. the right country that you are, were waiting for. Uh, so between two um, positions as a teacher, I was working for Pro de Santé, um, but I was passionate about my work with uh, children at the time. And then I decided to join the company because I like the management at this company. I like the project because the project is not only... It's, I wanted to do something that matters. Teaching children matters. But I, but I was in the uh, French national education and my boss weren't um, what I was expecting from a boss to be. Uh, so there, you know, there is no room for initiative in mm -hmm. the in the national education system. It's like a rigid framework, you exactly. should not and must so they not don't, cross. They don't make a difference between a very good, can, involved teacher and someone that uh, do their job uh, kind of routine every year. Mm -hmm. So I was full of initiative. I wanted to change the world and uh, education. But that and was medicine. not the proper context for you? No, I think you can, changing the world is changing one life at a time. So I think the impact you have on a child, uh, education on the child, on a child's life is very important. But I wanted to be supported by my management. And this was not the case. After 10 years, I was a bit um, discouraged about uh, making my vo voice heard by the, by the, the directors of mm -hmm. schools. And, uh, and I was very, very motivated by the project of Prodia Santé. Um, education and medicine are two pillars of uh, our society mm -hmm. and uh, health and education are, are the, the most important thing to create a good uh, future for our children. So I decided to join the uh, to jump into the adventure right. of yeah. Speaking of uh, recruitment, what does it take to be a recruiter? It takes a lot of, it takes um, quality of hearing people, hearing uh, what they need um, on both sides. 
uh, the client, the hospital, uh, the institution that is in need of a new doctor, mm -hmm. and the doctor. Because when it comes to changing jobs, you have to hear the wishes of the doctor and to create a good match between both of them. Uh, the wishes of the doctor, you mean? Uh, what like they are expecting from uh -huh. a new position. Their expectations, their hopes, their dreams hopes, probably. Dreams and because we work a lot um, um, on expatriate positions, meaning mm -hmm. that a doctor comes from a country and will move to another country to join their position, uh, we have to take everything into account, uh, the cultural side, the, the job itself, of course, the qualifications and the match between uh, the expectations of the institution and, and the, the qualifications of the doctor, mm -hmm. but also the cultural side. And because I have a, a background in anthropology, this um, cultural part was very interesting for me as well. Uh, what are the biggest challenges when it comes to recruiting doctors from uh, different parts of the world? You know, different cultural background, educational system, uh, yeah. So you, you have to understand everything. You have to, because reading a CV from a French doctor, because I was, uh, I I've initially worked in France. So reading a, a CV from a French doctor, you understand the educational system and you know, because, you know, I know how um, the medicine school work in France, but when it comes to uh, reviewing a CV from a foreign doctor, you have to understand how it works in their country. So we work with American doctors, Canadian doctors, but also doctors from Lebanon, uh, doctors from uh, Syria, uh, doctors from uh, China, mm -hmm. uh, from everywhere. So we have to understand how it works to see uh, if they can um, have a medical license in the country they target because uh, medicine is a very regulated profession so they have to register with the medical council in the country where, uh, where, where they work and we have to uh, understand the guidance of every country. Uh, so I'm assuming there is a lot of red tape a involved. A lot of red tape. So we have a legal council that can, uh, she can help us understand uh, when it's a bit complicated, but we read a lot and we we study a lot of the regulations mm -hmm. to see who is eligible to go in this country or in that country. Right, and uh, time-wise, what's the timing like when it comes to recruiting from A to Z? For example, you approach me, there is a, I'm a good fit and you want to hire me. So how long does it usually take for me to be actually hired by a hospital? So if uh, by hired you mean uh, you sign a contract, it yeah. could be very fast. It could be... But signing contract means I Yeah, am you have official. a position okay. that is waiting for you. And I start practicing from, as a doctor? No, but yeah. from the time you sign a contract to the time you join your position. So before joining your position, you have to get the medical license. So be accepted by the country. Mm -hmm. It can take uh, six months to two years. For example, Two when years. we bring yeah we bring French doctors to Quebec, uh, so they have interviews, they sign a contract, uh, but then they have to do a training, they have to come here to do a three months training in a internship kind of internship in a hospital, and then they have to apply for a permit for a visa, and so it takes one year and a half. Mm -hmm. And. Okay, so what if, like you said, a two-year time period, yeah. max, or even more? Max, no, top. Okay, and, uh, and I'm currently a doctor practicing at Hospital X. Mm -hmm. How does this work, like the transition from the hospital where I am working, and then uh, the potential hospital you're proposing? Like th this transition might be a bit complicated. So it's like, this is my understanding. I have to stop working at my home hospital and wait for your response to be hired and start working or relocating so, to a different country. Yeah, like, we, 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 I, we I'm try a bit to avoid that. So yeah. we advise our doctors 
to give their resignation letter because you know they have a notice period to accomplish okay. before uh, leaving their job because they can't quit the hospital in two weeks. So, yes, for example, in Spain they can uh, leave the hospital, uh, give their notice, and two weeks later they can go elsewhere. But usually the notice period is three to six months. So we advise the doctors to give their notice once they have their visa and medical license mm -hmm. in the country. So the hospital uh, that hire them uh, can wait three more months or two, mon two right. more months. Right. And how do you ensure a doctor you recruit uh, is a good fit for, for the hospital? Oh, so this is a... Uh, the basics of recruitment. So, recruitment so we, 101. Yeah, we're recruitment 101. So we, we, we run uh, thorough interviews of our doctors. First, we, we, we have a very close relationship, a very close communication uh, with our clients, the mm -hmm. institutions, and our doctors. So the clients, we ask a lot of questions to the clients to really understand and narrow down the search so we tr we target the right candidates because our goal is to sa for them to save time so they hire us so they can they, they will not have to review CVs that don't correspond to their expectations so we 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 have a close communications with a communication with our clients and we run thorough interviews of our candidates, of our doctors. Some of them, we already know them because we've been working with them in different um, contexts. Uh, they can do locum job for us in different countries. Um, and, and we ask a lot of questions. Uh, we review the qualifications. Mm -hmm. We verify everything. Uh, we call the previous hospital where they have worked to verify if they are good doctors, if we don't know them, if we have never worked with them. And, uh, and then we organize an interview between the institution and the doctor. And our, our um, statistics is that if after three candidates that we send, um, the hospital doesn't find uh, a doctor they want to hire it's because we have misunderstood something mm -hmm. because usually after three candidates amongst this those three candidates they find the right one so if 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 it doesn't work then we uh, call our clients and we say okay maybe we have misunderstood something or maybe it's what a, exactly it, you're looking for it's a, it's a bit different when you when during the interview you give information that we you haven't uh, given us before so mm -hmm. maybe we could sit again talk again and have more information okay but yeah there's something missing how would you tell a doctor if they're not a good match and they might lack qualifications, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, sometimes the doctors uh, are not a good fit for, for the position that we have. So uh, if it's a matter of qualification, we tell them that they are not eligible for the position. We are very transparent in our uh, communication with the doctors um, because th that's why they trust us, because we never, uh, we don't want them to have um, false hope about a position and we know the regulation in the country, uh, in the countries. Um, and so we tell them, okay, you are not eligible for this position because we need this level of uh, qualification. Mm -hmm. And in your country, for example, you're not eligible for medical lessons at this level. So we are transparent for that. Um, then sometimes on, on paper, they, are, um, they tick all the, all the boxes. Mm -hmm. but, in practice... but then during the interview, uh, the personality doesn't match with the client's expectations. So we tell them, okay, they are looking. So it's more dedicated to tell that to, mm -hmm. to someone, but we try to find a diplomatic way to tell them that maybe for this opportunity, it wouldn't be a good match because mm -hmm. they are looking for someone. Um, we try, we find a way to tell right. them. And, and for example, if we find it, it, it sometimes it happens, uh, we, we do a, um, um, a background check of the doctors, their reputation on internet, uh, if they have, um, if everything is clear in their uh, record. And sometimes we find someone who hasn't uh, a clear record. Uh, so we have doctors who have been convinced for uh, this or that. 
So we are straightforward with them. We tell them, okay, because you have a problem of medical malpractice, uh, we cannot work with you because, you know, we mm -hmm. need to be, um, our, our clients trust us uh, to do this uh, background check. Mm -hmm. And this is, again, Recruitment 101. <laughs> and so we have to tell the doctors, unfortunately, because you have been uh, suspended uh, from, your, your license has been suspended two years ago for six months, one mm -hmm. year, I don't know. You are not eligible for an expatriate opportunity because uh, the country will not grant you the license, the medical right. license to practice. Yeah. Uh, it's delicate. Yeah. Speaking of trends, uh, any trends or changes in the medical recruitment that have emerged in recent years? Yes, it's, um, it's easier uh, lately to attract doctors uh, to countries, um, to foreign countries where they were a bit suspicious before. Uh, for example, uh, the Middle Eastern countries, um, they are more keen to accept positions there because we have noticed that especially European doctors, uh, they are no longer happy in their practice in their country. Uh, they lack of uh, consideration from their government. This unhappiness comes from where? Is it like uh, lack of recognition? From Lack, lack of recognition, mm -hmm. um, the salary are lower than before, uh, work conditions. A lot of European doctors tell us that they can't practice quality medicine at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, they have to, they don't have a lot of time to spend with any, uh, every patient. And this is, when you are a good professional, this is something unbearable to have only 10 minutes for a patient. This is not good medicine. So they want to, and they want to go to uh, institutions where they will have time to um, perform a quality, to have a quality. Uh, quality treatment. Quality treatment and also quality time with their patients. Mm -hmm. And that's why we, we also noticed that uh, the government or hospital, the public hospitals are losing doctors uh, and, and the, the private sector is, uh, uh, attracts more uh, physicians lately. We see that in the Western world, um, physicians from the Western world, especially Europe, um, are looking to expatriate. Uh, they want to find um, a place, they, they fantasize a lot about the Middle <clears throat> East, about Asia, about Canada, um, because they think that... Is it just a fantasy or the real one? Uh, it's, it's, the, no, I mean, the fantasy is what they imagine it would be okay. if they go work there, because the reality will be very different, right? right. Because they don't... Uh, they, they don't um, think about the cultural shock they will experience. The position, they, it takes a lot of humility to expatriate in another country, to another country, because um, you are no one when you expatriate in another, to another country. Uh, you have to learn uh, different ways of practicing medicine. Systems are different. Mm -hmm. Uh, so a European, a, a French doctor, a French doctor, for example, here in Quebec, uh, we have French doctors at the moment who are following their three months training uh, in order to have their medical license here. Uh, so they have to learn new things. Um, they have to learn how uh, medicine is uh, made here, mm -hmm. uh, time spent with patients. And it's a good surprise for them because uh, <clears throat> here, um, the salary are higher for physicians than in France, uh, but also the time that a doctor spend with a, a patient is um, is a, a time of quality, and and it's the, the that work quality is, time is like better than what they might experience in their home country. Yes, exactly. Okay. And, and the work after you see a patient, the work that you have to do, the report that you have to do are more thorough than in France, for example. And, uh, but they also have to learn new things about the acronyms because you know, medicine is, in medicine, there are a lot of acronyms yeah. and here everything is translated uh, from English to French. 
as opposed to in France, uh, we keep the acronym as they are yeah, in like English. Yeah, KFC. So, yeah, KFC, for example. <laughs> yeah. So same in medicine. So they have to learn everything about that. But again, I would like to talk about the, the cultural shock. It's always a cultural shock in any country. And our uh, duty is to prepare, to prepare our doctors to experience and to prepare the doctors right. for this culture prepare the mindset uh, prepare the mindset and and they have to uh, they have to adapt have yeah but have that in mind have that okay. in mind before moving so you need to cook them well <laughs> yeah we need to cook them well right uh, how would you attract a top medical doctor to a country that might not be their first choice relocation wise Okay, so um, to attract a doctor, to a doctor to a different country, you first attract them with the, the job itself. So the content mm, of the point. job. Uh, you, the institution. Uh, for example, we work in a, in, a, in a country with a very reputable British hospital. So maybe it, would, it wouldn't have been the first choice for, one of our doctor, for some of our doctors, but because the name is big, uh, very prestigious, then they accept to go to this country to work for this specific institution. Uh, so uh, the content of the job... The so it's not only the matter of salary? No, no, no. It's almost never a matter of salary, oh. to be honest with you. Almost lately, never. Almost never. Because at the moment, expatriate positions, uh, um, except for maybe specific expatriate position, leading positions, but normal positions like consultants, expatriate positions, the salary is almost the same as in, uh, in, uh, in Europe. In North America, they really, they, they, doctors from North America are more visiting doctors because mm -hmm. for a permanent position, there is no uh, competitive country compared to uh, Canada or uh, the USA. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not sure if it applies to your uh, job domain, uh, but in recruitment, it might be related. Uh, fictitious or fake uh, job postings. There it's are a lot. Why? Oh, I... For God's sake, that's, why that's do we get so many question. fictitious job postings, especially that's... on LinkedIn? 95%, that's my personal opinion, by the way. 95% of job postings we see on LinkedIn, not real. That's crazy. And, you know, specifically in the Middle East, um, there are a lot of fake positions and there are, there are a lot of fake contracts, even contracts. Oh. We have a doctor the other day, it was maybe like any, one or two months ago. Uh, so she called us, yeah, I, I um, accept it because our positions, the salary would be around 15 to $20,000 per month, okay, for, for a, good, a good position. And she told us, okay, I don't understand why your positions, um, the salary that you offer are so low because I have been offered a position for 40,000 plus a, a car, uh, the accommodation, everything. Okay, yeah, oh, good for you, doctor, good for you. So would you mind sharing the contract with us? So she sh shared the contract with us. And, we and that's had not to, real. No, that's not real. Mm. And it was one of our clients. So we, so we told her, okay, we work with them. That's impossible that they offered you 40,000. It's a fake offer. There were, there was uh, the logo of the, of the hospital, everything, but the contract, there are a lot of typos in the contract. So yeah, it's, it was obvious for us that it was a fake contract, but you call our client and tell them, okay, someone is using their name, your name uh, to attract doctors. I don't know why. Sometimes it's because at some point they ask you for a deposit. Okay, you have this job, you have the contract, then to finalize everything, you have to give us 4,000 US dollars. Deposit for what? Mm -hmm. And this is a regular thing that doctor, like potential doctors need to deposit before they get hired? So this is unethical from my opinion. In my opinion, okay. this is unethical, but some companies do that. So we, we never... You mean recruiting companies? Recruiting okay. companies. So for some physicians, it's not surprising to have to pay something to be recruited. So in 25 years, uh, we've been operating uh, in this business for 25 years. We've never asked 
a penny to our doctors and we intend to continue like that. So we always tell the physicians, be careful when someone is asking money mm -hmm. because it might be a fake offer or it might be not a very uh, serious company, serious recruitment company, mm -hmm. and it's unethical. Right. And is this true hospitals publish a job posting only for the purpose of receiving CVs? I'm not sure that's true in the medical, uh, in right. medical recruitment because it's a lot of work. We know that worldwide there is a lack of physicians and mm. nurses. So every institution that we know is in need of physicians and nurses. So when they post a, a, a job, when they do a job posting, it's because they have a position. Mm -hmm. And receiving a, a, a lot of CVs is a lot of work. That's why we exist, to help them to, to, to shortlist the candidates that we send. We never uh, drown them under 50 CVs at, 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 uh, at once. I mean, we select the candidates, we run interviews, and we only send the potential perfect fit. Uh, but uh, yeah, I don't think I don't think it's. Uh, and they are very disorganized. All the all the healthcare institutions we are working with, even the more prestigious, are very disorganized. So the recruitment is, they really need help. I hope the, they don't get offended. <laughs> no, 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 no. But. It, the, 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 the human resources, mm. most of the hospitals we are working with, it, it's... They're very slow. Why, why that? They are slow, but it's a cultural thing sometimes. In certain parts of the world, it's not that they are slow. They, are, they have a different... Um, they have a pace. Mm. I mean, it's, it's, it's a cultural It's their thing. ideal pace, but not exactly. to everyone. Not, not, maybe not ours. Yeah. No, but you know, there is... Uh, a shortage of employees in every sector. So in the human resources as well. So the human resources department in a hospital, there, are, there is a shortage of uh, employees. So one employee cannot do the job of four employees. Mm -hmm. So it's different and, and there is a lot of change, changing employees also. So it's, it's difficult to keep things on tracks. So every, everybody struggles about the same things everywhere. It's not only restaurants and, uh, and bars and uh, it's also the hospitals Hospital. and everything everywhere. It's a common thing. In, yeah, in, it's in, a common thing yeah. and it's worldwide. Yeah. I'm a doctor looking to work in a different country. What advice would you give me? Um, so first advice, um, you should speak with your wife or your partner mm -hmm. and your family. And first... Yeah, that's important. Yeah, that's very important. Uh, and be aware that when you are in your new country, you are far from your family. So life will be different. So first advice would be to get information about the country you target. The country you are interested in, you have to... Of course, we give a lot of information. We give information about schools for children, about the the nightlife, about the social life, about the expat community. We give a lot of um, information, but they have also the so cost of living. So that's your edge, that's your company's edge. Yeah, but we don't know your criteria. You are a doctor, I don't know your criteria. I don't know how you live. So that's why our interviews are lengthy, because we speak mm. a lot about the personal life as well. So we mm. always excuse ourselves. Sorry, doctor, I don't want to be intrusive, but Tell me about yourself, your family. Uh, is it a family project? It's always one of our questions. And so I would advise um, you to give information, uh, take information about the country, speak with your wife, your partner, your children, if you have children, uh, see if uh, the family embarks on the project because the, you will need support to achieve this uh, goal. And then, um, and then I would advise you to improve your level of English mm -hmm. <laughs> if you need to. And I would, uh, I would tell you, I know a very good teacher at Cyrus Language Tech. You could maybe have conversation with him <laughs> from time to time to improve yeah. your English. No, and I would, I would advise you to have an open mind when you arrive in, in the country, to be humble, mm -hmm. uh, to accept, to learn from your peers. 
even if you are very experienced doctors because you have to be in a you have to put yourself in a position of humility when you arrive in a country at least during the probation period and then when you prove that you are a good asset for the hospital then the road is open and you can spread your wings and uh, make a name uh, in the country and be happy mm -hmm. but the adaptation to a new country takes three to uh, six months usually three to six months yeah i was expatriated in different countries and every time it took me at least three months to adapt to the country and uh what this distinguishes protea sante from other recruiting companies i know you've been in the in the domain for like 25 years plus first uh and foremost we are ethical recruitment company and that makes a huge difference. Uh, our ethics is the most important thing and our chairman and CEO always insist on the ethics and the relationship we create, the transparency we create with our clients and our candidates. Um, we, we work with our professionalism and personality and we never push either the hospital or the doctor mm -hmm. to close the deal. Mm -hmm. So you never manipulate. We never manipulate because at the end, you know, we've been there for 25 years and maybe for the 25 years to come. And there is, there is no, uh, it's, not, it's not for nothing that we, we've been in this for 25 years and, and still growing mm -hmm. every year. It's because we, at the end of the day, it's a service that we that we give to the to, to the physician who is looking for a new position, a new challenge in their life, and to the institutions that are in urgent need of new uh, physicians. So we want them to create something that will last. For us, it's not it's something not reliable. satisfying to, to 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 place a doctor only for one year. We want the, the team to be solid mm -hmm. and permanent so every patient can have a doctor in front of them at the end of the day. Right. And what you like and dislike about your job? Uh, I like speaking with people from everywhere. I, I, I spoke uh, recently with an Indian transplant surgeon. Uh, it was very interesting and, and physicians are very generous. Mm -hmm. with with uh, what they share with us uh, so if if you call them and they have time you can ask a lot of questions so we learn a lot of things we are not doctors we i don't have a, a scientific background mm -hmm. i'm more like a, i have an anthropologic background right. so it's nothing to do with uh, with medicine yeah. but i learn a lot of things uh, we learn a lot of cultural things from uh, the way people receive what we what we say from their way of expressing themselves mm -hmm. um, we know the healthcare system in a lot of countries this is very interesting and what i like the most is that we do something that matters we help uh, patients to have access to healthcare so we we don't save life but we help we help people who save life every day. Mm -hmm. So this is important for me. And what I dislike the most is the so red tape. So you have a strong indirect impact. Yeah, we have a strong indirect impact. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's exactly it. You summarized it very well. Yeah. Um, and what I dislike is the, the, the red tape. Everything around administrative process, lengthy administrative process, and medical the medical profession is regulated and it's normal because it's an important profession but you know it could be things could be easier and it would be beneficial for a lot of countries how would you change things if you were in charge uh, so because if you remember we we in one or two sessions we, we discussed an article about uh, medical doctors shortage in Canada mm -hmm. and I asked you similar qu a similar question so um, <laughs> if I could change things I, I would have to be Ministry of Health to change things <laughs> and it, it will not happen <laughs> I'm not qualified for the job um, but I would 
facilitate uh, it, it, it's different from a country to another. If you speak about Canada, I would, for example, facilitate um, the medical license, the registration with the medical council in every province. Because you know that in, in Canada, uh, when you are registered in, a, in, in Quebec, you can't go to a locum job in Ontario mm -hmm. unless you are registered in Ontario. And you, you, you have to... There is a process, an administrative it's process. It's a cultural process. And yeah. you have to go through you're, all these processes, even inside Canada. Even inside Canada, uh, which is very different in a European country like France or, uh, um, I don't know, the, the UK, or it's not from part of Europe, but the UK, Italy. When you have a license, you can work everywhere in the country. Here, it's per province. So this is complicated. I had an anesthesiologist from Quebec who was ready to go locum jump in um, Labrador. Hmm. So she went for one week, but she never uh, succeeded in getting a license in Labrador. So she couldn't help the hospital because so some she administrative... Got re rejected? She, yes. She, the, the process was too long. Ah. So she, she couldn't help them. She was, uh, she was um, available. She graduated from Quebec <laughs> and she, she wanted to do a locum job, one week locum job, because the hospital was in a, in, in, in a, in a position where the anesthesiologist wasn't there. So she, she was available for one week and their doctor wasn't there. She was, he was sick. And she couldn't, she couldn't help them for one week because she couldn't uh, get a license. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's, it's unbelievable. Uh, I don't understand why it's so complicated. And, I, and, and I'm not the only one. Most of the, the Canadian doctors don't understand why it's so complicated to get a license in another province mm -hmm. and why it's, why it's not automatic. I mean, Quebec, it's a bit different because we speak French, so maybe... Or a universal system, a universal portal where they can kind of verify their documents. We, we don't have such a thing, right? No. Like, oh, gosh. No, you, you, it's not very complicated to, to register uh, in a, uh, to a medical council in another province, but you have to do it and it could take one month. Mm. So that's, that's weird. I understand that in Quebec, it's different because there is... French language. So you have to prove that you speak French to, to, to be able to work here. But inside the Anglophone uh, Canada, it's complicated. So I don't understand. I would change that. And also uh, I would change, um, yeah, the lengthy process. I mean, the verification process is normal uh, that you verify that it's the, the, the diplomas, degrees are real and not fake, that's normal, but it takes one month. So sometimes it's a bit puzzling for us to see that it takes six months, one year to get a license in a country. Okay. And during the pandemic, we, we had a lot of doctors available to, um, to, to go help countries in need. Uh, and they preferred, sometimes they preferred to, to take the military people with mm. no medical training than to accept a doctor from another country. I mean, it's, it, it's crazy. It's completely crazy. It's a, it's a waste of skills. I mean, there are a lot of doctors here uh, uh, that wanted, who wanted to help during the pandemic. Um, and we proposed to the government, we had a lot of doctors who wanted to help. But even during a major crisis like this, they wouldn't, they wouldn't accept to maybe give them a, a provisional license only during a few months to help the, I don't know, the CHSLD who were in need of nurses, doctors and everything. No, they took the military. Why military? Because they were available? Or? Yeah, because they were mm. available, but they don't have any Quality. medical experience. Okay. So. It's not understandable. How would you overcome language and communication hurdles in international recruitment? Uh, we speak in English, mostly. We speak in English um, because it's the universal language. 
Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I would prefer it, 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 it <laughs> French. <would> be French. <laughs> no, it's the universal language. So we speak English with uh, doctors. Sometimes we struggle to understand them when their accent is very strong or when they speak fast. Indian doctors, Bangladeshi doctors, they speak very fast. Like, at least they master the language. Mm -hmm. But for some of uh, other doctors, um, we tell them to take some uh, private uh, English classes, uh, conversation classes. So, because we, as a team, uh, take classes to um, maintain our level of English, to learn new things. So, yes, we... With a lovely teacher. With a lovely teacher <laughs> named Daniel. Uh, yeah, so that's, I think that it, that is important. And that's why I accepted to do this interview, because it's very important to um, at least have one very good language of communication. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's important because, you know, doctors, they say, OK, I do Duolingo, I do blah, blah, blah. No, Duolingo is good to travel. But it's not good as a profession. We tell them, you are a doctor, you are not a mm. hairdresser. You know, when, right. you, when there is a language mistake, it could have very bad consequences. Yeah. So we advise them to meet our teacher, Daniel, <laughs> at Cyrus Language Tech. And uh, yeah, it helps a lot. So I think it's very important. Yeah. Thank you very much, Manuel, for your time. That was a very informative talk. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel.